ladies and gents. How's life treating you? How are things going? I want all of you to know it is Sunday. And believe it or not, this happens to be the anniversary of my mother's birth. September 19th. Ladies and gentlemen, no, I don't celebrate holidays. This is just the day she was born, okay? So I don't celebrate no birthdays of somebody wanting to worship themselves. It's just, this was her day. You know what I'm saying? So I don't mind giving people their day because, hey, everybody deserves a day. So why not make it your day? Well, why can't I celebrate on my day? Well, here's the problem. When you celebrate your day, Oh, let me turn down this instrumental. That's right, it's an instrumental, y'all. Um, I, I, sorry, I was listening to it and I kind of got into it, and you know, it was, it was getting my attention. Okay, what's happening? As you can hear, it's in the background. We're gonna be right at twenty-seven. The last video was too loud, so I do some adjustments. Okay, and then they didn't like Luther Vandross dance with my father. Mm -mm. They said, uh, uh you ain't playing that. Mm -mm. We gonna block that mother, uh, uh you ain't playing that. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, can you celebrate a day to yourself? Yes, you can, you have that right. I mean, it is still selfish, but you have that right. You can pick any day of the year to celebrate. Okay, but however, when you choose the day you were born on, you don't realize that you're practicing a pagan ritual. Not my bad. I know, I know that ain't your intent. But look, let me tell you something. It ain't got nothing to do with your mother intent. All right? It's the principle and how it got started. So if you don't want to be caught up in the mix. No, see, y'all don't believe me. If you don't want to be caught up in the mix, do you not know where they get the aiding and abetting and accessory whole idea from in law they get it from the scriptures that's right you can participate in something without being directly involved all you got to do is continue to practice okay just hey i'm just letting you know that's where they got it from so don't worry about it i ain't into this and i you can be not into whatever you want don't want to be into it don't matter that's what i'm trying to tell y'all Y'all don't understand. So let me give y'all some understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, what I need you guys to pay attention to is this is the mortgage complaint and case law folder summary judgment folder subfolder files. Everything's in there. All you need to do, listen to me. All you need to do, listen to me. All you need to do is download all four. Now, what I want to do, you guys, I want to do you this favor. You don't mind if I do you a favor. I want to let you know that today is a much better day because I'm much more relaxed. I got a meeting in two hours, so an hour and a half. And that meeting is one that was pre-scheduled before I went on my no meetings on Sunday. I, I, I go to a meeting. I just My meeting just finished uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, so... I go to that meeting and we were talking about eagles and pride you know and it was unique how the information was being brought out regarding eagle and pride now it wasn't a sermon on eagle and pride it was a watchtower article Jehovah's was witnesses on sunday they have uh, what's known as a public discourse or a public talk and that's about 30 minutes long then after that public talk, they go over the watchtower, which is an hour long. So the meeting is a total of one hour and 45 minutes. One hour and 45 minutes? You only spoke about an hour and 30 minutes. You didn't talk about no 15. What y'all doing for the other 15 minutes? Well, it's called song. They sing praises to Jehovah. So they sing beginning, middle, end. Hold on now. We ain't finished. You got to understand this. Then there is a opening prayer and a concluding prayer. So an hour and 45 minutes. There you go, all right? Okay. 
So I have that meeting in about an hour and 35 minutes. And before I have that meeting, I wanted to talk with you all about this. I'm going to I'm going to pause the music, although I want to hear you are so beautiful to me. I, I want to hear that, Mr. Crocker, but I can't hear that Crocker song now, okay, because we got to talk. We're going to do a little bit of giving you guys an understanding. Don't you like the water? Man, that, that is a lot of water, and it's pure, too. I like the water on Earth. No, that's a different world. Okay, that's the world of Mungambo. Okay, Mungambo, it's its own world. And guess what? If you want, you can have the very same theme for whatever world you want to create. Because you can live in your own world and you don't have to have any visitors. Oh, I see. You living in your own world, ain't you? Mm-hmm living in there by yourself too, huh? But I hear you talking to a whole lot of people. You must be. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, child. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me help you guys to understand something. Many people have been going into court and they've been trying to defend their house and protect it from foreclosure. What they didn't know is that the United States Congress and your state legislatures got together with the banks and they said, look guys, we got to protect these citizens' rights because that's what they put us in office for. But also, you know, you guys, y'all y'all be patting our pockets and everything, and we like the patting in our pockets because them seats are kind of high. So I need more padding. So what we're going to do for y'all is we're going to streamline the judicial process just for you. We ain't going to do it for nobody else. See, we ain't going to have no non-judicial anything else just on foreclosures by financial institutions. Yes, we're going to do this especially for you. But uh -uh, before we do, where's my money? Oh, it's in my, it's in my offshore account? All right. All right, so no, we're going to take care of that. All right. And, so, huh? Well, they get to, no, we ain't going to tell them that they get to bring a <laughs> non-judicial foreclosure against you. No, we ain't going to tell them that. No, 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 no. See, because the Equal Protection of Law says that if you can bring a non-judicial foreclosure, they can bring a non-judicial foreclosure. No, no, it, it's not. It's technically, it's not called non-judicial foreclosure. That's just the name of the act. No, it's just called a summary judgment. That's all. You just come in and you, you bring forth your evidence and you ask for a summary judgment. As long as there is no evidence to the contrary, and these people ain't going to know no better, they going to walk up into the courtroom bringing all this paperwork that ain't going to mean nothing. The only thing we're there to hear is whether or not they're in default. That's it. Now, they're going to come up with this arbitration association, and they're going to come up with these contracts, and they're going to say that that's all they're there to hear, whether or not there's a default. <laughs> that's what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going to tell them that, yeah, y'all can do that. We're just going to make it look like we don't know what they're doing. We're going to tell them that, now. Nah, y'all can't do that, even though Congress is going to say, yeah, they can. Now, don't worry about that. Don't worry. I told you. We got you. All right, boo? We got you. That's what you guys are dealing with. What's happening is that foreclosure, non-judicial foreclosure, and foreclosure in and of itself, ladies and gentlemen, it's a summary judgment. That's why you don't get to call any witnesses. Do you not notice that? You don't get to call any witnesses. You don't get the counter claim or counter suit. No, they took away that ability. See, that's the way it used to be. They want to kick you out of your house. They had to go through the whole legal process. But they complained that it was taking too long. And they couldn't make enough money. So they shortened it. And they did the non-judicial foreclosure. Well... 30, 40, 50, 60 years, ladies and gentlemen, of non-judicial foreclosures. And you know what? Nobody came up with a valid solution that worked for everybody until now. Now, what I want to do, just to show you, technically, we're going to show you the memorandum of court citations. There you go. A party, borrower, must have an interest in the collateral 
prior to pledging collateral a security for the loan. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this right here was done for you so that when you put together your document, you ain't got to explain that. All you got to do is do like one or two paragraphs and tell them, see the memorandum of court concurring citations. Just that simple. Pay attention. We're going to stop here. Notwithstanding compliance with nine of the Uniform Commercial Code, a security interest will not attach or actually come into being until the secured party gives value and the debtor acquires rights to the collateral. So until you receive the loan, this is the value, until you receive the loan, there is no security interest. And until you buy the house, there is no security interest. So until you take possession of the house, uh-uh. Now look, Article 9 says there must be, at a minimum, a written security agreement that describes the collateral and is signed by the debtor. Not signed by all parties, unilaterally by the debtor. That's why there's only one signature. Go ahead. Take a look at your paperwork. Except for in places like Georgia, they don't have deeds of trust. So Georgia has three signatures on it. An attorney, a notary, and yours. Somebody witnessing it taking place. Three witnesses. I mean, two witnesses. I'm sorry. But when you count yourself, you're the third witness. That's why they do that in Georgia. Hold on. We're not finished yet. This works for Georgia and every other state. Further, a security interest will not is not enforceable against the debtor with respect to collateral that does not attach. Ladies and gentlemen, we're challenging the security issue. We're challenging the collateral. Why? Why are we challenging the collateral? Because if you want to attack something, you have to go to its foundation. You have to undermine the foundation of the whole process. You see, they're using the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act, but the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act only applies to secure loans. Now, uh uh-uh, that word is very misleading. It doesn't mean a secured loan that somebody went ahead and had you sign your collateral to the loan afterwards. It means secured loan from the very beginning. Your loan was not a secured loan. Your loan, when you initially purchased the property, and those of you who refinanced, you have to bring the argument that when you initially purchased the property, it wasn't a secure loan. You just found out. Statute of limitation does not commence to run when there is fraud. Statute of limitation does not commence to run until the last overt act has been accomplished. So you will have to attack the original and then say that the individuals who came in, you don't owe them a dime. They have to get their money from the original lender who committed the fraud. You're going to have to explain that because I didn't do this for the refinancers. Sorry. The refinancers still can use it, but the refinancers are going to have to bring in the argument about the original note. Go after the original note. Okay? Now, that's that first section. Now, this is 17 pages, ladies and gentlemen. So I want you to know it ain't no penny any case law. All right? Oh, what, what did I highlight right there for y'all? It is elementary that the debtor's equity in the property would be that amount of its value and above the amount necessary to satisfy the first secure debt. Ladies and gentlemen, it's talking about your equity and it's talking about the, the courts coming to this logical understanding about the collateral of your property and what it is and it is not. That's all we did, ladies and gentlemen, is we decided that we were going to put the laws together for you so that when you're standing there in court, you just use their words against them. Stop going in there and saying all that junk you guys say. Now, injuries were caused by RISPA violations. RISPA, Real Estate Investment Settlement Procedure Act. I didn't remember what the SP stood for, but I told you it didn't stand for secure party. But it's a settlement, okay? 
pay attention of damages and should not be construed to require actual injury. Some people have gone into court on RISPA and say the person hasn't shown how they were actually injured by the damage. Uh, 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 mm -mm. We brought about injuries mentally, physically, your credit worthiness, your reputation in the field of housing and real estate. We brought your damages. You ain't got to do nothing, people. It's a universal document. Works for everybody in every situation because that's what I did. I took all of you into consideration. Well, technically, when I asked my God for a little bit of assistance because I couldn't figure out how to help everybody at one time, and then came up when in a conversation with somebody, I said, you need to do a summary judgment. And after I said that, I'm like, wait a minute, I got to call you back. Mm -mm -mm. I done just came up with something. Okay? Like I told you, I'd be surprising myself. Because I didn't know it was summary judgment. But I know I could get a summary judgment. Why? Why did I know I could get a summary judgment? Well, non-judicial foreclosure involves them sending you all these administrative notices. And what they've been telling people is that they have to start a separate action. No, you don't. These individuals are using a non-judicial foreclosure, so they're using a non-court access or court hearing process. Well, the only other process that is a non-court hearing process is summary judgment. So it begged the dip that they were doing a summary judgment against you and the court was giving them a judgment. They were just calling it eviction. Ah, so you know what that means? Y'all got to do some research on summary judgments. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on now, we ain't finished. That's, that's just this section. It says it's not necessary for the plaintiff to show actual physical injury to recover damages. See, you're going after damages. Damages! It is not enough that the plaintiff sustained damages. So we covered everything that they say you need to include in a complaint. We did that for you. So you ain't got to do nothing. We did it for you. Now, we're going to continue. We're going to read probably one more. Let me get something that's substantive, not something that's short, short and quick. We want something that's substantive. Let's do this one right there. There you go. The Sixth Circuit has noted that there is no requirement that the distress be severe in nature, as Carrie's requirement that actual injury be proven severe uh, serves merely to ensure that the plaintiffs are not compensated for illusory injury. So basically, again, you don't have to actually prove that you suffered physical injury, but that you suffered injury. The borrower's rights to the collateral, satisfying a before acquired collateral security and not a security interest in an after acquired collateral. Do you know what before acquired? That means you had the collateral at the very beginning before you acquired the property. So they use the collateral as backing or co signing for the loan. After acquired collateral says that after they done sat up there and stabbed you in the back, then they want to give you a napkin and tell you, I'm sorry. That's the after acquired collateral. Okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, it works like this. A security agreement may create or provide for a security interest in after acquired collateral, but that interest will not attach until the debtor acquires the collateral which makes the original loan not a secured loan, but an after-acquired loan secured by collateral. And guess what? That makes it a personal loan. Does it matter if it's secured by collateral or not? It is not a mortgage. Pay attention. It is not a mortgage. Go look at the definition for a mortgage, which your loan is not a mortgage. A mortgage is a loan that is backed by collateral. Your loan was not backed by collateral until after you signed it, not before. So that's after acquired collateral. Now remember, that's their word. They created that legal term. 
And they created that legal term because they had to make it easy for the banks. It, it, it's Sunday morning. They had to make it easy for the banks. Okay? So after acquired collateral, that's what this is talking about. So that's included. Letting them know that after acquired collateral doesn't make it a mortgage. Remember, that's language of the courts and language of Congress. That doesn't take away from the fact that you better read your complaint. The motion for summary judgment, <laughs> that all that talks nothing but about your private property and how Congress has said that your private property, they can't regulate. Ladies and gentlemen, they can't regulate private property. What, what do they regulate? Oh, they regulate real estate. They regulate real estate and real property. Ladies and gentlemen, your property is not real estate nor real property. Do you know why? Because your property is grandfathered in under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And the Northwest Ordinance. Why? Because it secured your right to property. So Congress did not have any authority to rewrite your security. You already had the inalienable right to property, and that's all you highlight. Okay? That is all you highlight. Now, give me a second. I got to add one more thing. We're going to add this, and then we're going to upload it again. So y'all got to bear with me. I'm going to pause y'all for just a second, because I got to add one more thing. I thought it was here, and it ain't. I'm going to take the document and put this one. The other one was for judges. This is for mortgage companies. You can even add the judges' names to this document. This is for you and Mr. Johnson. You'll be better off with this document than the other, although the other one will work as well. This one is more specific towards your mortgage, okay? And dealing with Plaza and Penny Mac. So what I will do is give me one moment to locate the document and I'll put it in an email now so that I don't have to worry about forgetting later because I do forget often. And while I do that, you all will have to excuse me for but about two minutes. I have to go turn off the generator because it's been on for the last three hours and I don't need that much uh, charging of the batteries because I'm more than enough to get me through the next two days without having to turn it back on. So this is the mortgage fraud claim. I'm going to send you all the documents. Uh, give me one second to see if it'll let me send you these two. And then send you these two. So this is primarily for you and Mr. Johnson. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everybody else's names out of the email so it doesn't go to everybody, just the two of you. So I'll do that now to make sure that happens. And this particular set of documents have taken me the better part of three weeks in total to complete. A lot of hours. So we can get rid of that one. We can get rid of that one. We can get rid of that one. And we can get rid of that one. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let you know your footing and your standing from the very beginning. Like I said, give me one second to step out here. Turn off this, uh, Sorry, I'm laughing because the wind has blown one of my tents down. Which keeps happening, but it's a collapsible tent, so it ain't doing any damage. All right, it says it's sending it. So my hope is that it will send it and take care of business. And I just got to connect to the auxiliary battery so that I can take us off battery power.
So it'll be one more second to unplug the battery. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna to demonstrate to you what the documents are. We're only gonna be here for an hour. We'll not be here for an hour and a half or anything like that, just an hour. Again, this complaint is just against, let's make sure mortgage fraud, conspiracy to misrepresent, okay. Just wanna make sure. Now, what I did with this document is I added the information about the Chris system. Chris system is an investment system with the courts. Whenever you file a case and you pay money into that case or there's a fee waiver, they sit up and put the case in what's known as the court registry. They have an account that they put it in and they collect interest on the case. The only problem is they're collecting interest on your case, but you don't receive any benefits of that interest. All I can say is that's interesting. Since when has the court or any other branch of government been allowed to profit off of the people, especially a court system? But that's what happens all the time. So we added that information to the top. It's not a main point at all whatsoever. The only thing you're bringing in here is the fraud that's been perpetrated against you. We put this section in here and we add the congressional record if all property in the United States is owned by the state, then how can the bank foreclose on you? What authority are they operating under? This was in our cross complaint. You will put whether or not the loan was secured or unsecured. If the loan was given to you and you went to the bank, you and your wife to apply for the loan and the bank said, hey, what's your job history and your credit worthiness? We're gonna approve you for this amount. And if that's what they did, and you said, okay, and you signed on the dotted line, that is not a secured loan. A secured loan is a loan where when you go and apply for the loan says, well, no, your, your credit is horrible. You're gonna need a co-signer. That's a secured loan. Because now it's backed by collateral, somebody else's credit or somebody else's property. And they have to sign for it. That is a secured loan. Your loan is not a mortgage because a mortgage is a loan that is backed by security, not that was backed by security after the loan was issued. So that's what an unsecured loan is. You'll fill in the information. This is typable. It's not like one of the documents we made for people who are incarcerated. You can uh, type in this document. We made the type so that it's small enough to where if you needed to add a dissertation or a manifesto, it gives you more than enough room to do what you need to do. And this is interesting that the other two are not here. Uh, and it's the link, everybody has it, oh well. Okay, all of this, you don't have to change. These are facts, these are their own case laws. This is what the court is saying. We're not adding those words. We are just making a simple statement here. Of, and all you gotta do is answer the question from those two paragraphs. After you answer that question, you skip to the next section, which is this one. You answer this question from this paragraph. After you answer that question, then you answer this question. And then you enter the date of the alleged mortgage, the date that the mortgage was signed. And then you go here and what you're gonna do is after you print, then you can check all the other boxes, but this will only let you check one box on one row at a time. So you will have to manually check each box after printing. Then after you do this section and the next section, which is here, this is where you're explaining all the details of the complaint. What happened, who happened, why happened, when happened. Because the law says when you make a complaint, you have to explain that you were harmed or you were damaged, the person did this or did that, and they misrepresented information. There are so many things that you have to add to a complaint. We took care of that for everyone. We've already added all the things that the law says is necessary. The only thing you have to do is add in your statement of claim, the things you believe were done wrong. We already added all the other stuff that was done wrong. So all you got to do is say who did what, when did they do it, where they do it, why they do it, and so on and so forth. So 
that's this section. After you finish this section, then you answer this question. Now there, you can use additional pages if you need it. You don't have to just deal with this space. And then you check off those items. And after you finish with all of that, and I would suggest reading it because it is an affidavit. Each one of these items you will check because the case law that backs up all of this, government officials have a duty to respond to complaints. And the fact that the parties executed a deed of trust is no evidence that the party had an interest in the property. Now, that is literally what the case law says. Just because you signed a deed of trust doesn't mean that you actually had interest in the property when you signed the deed of trust. That's the main point. If there isn't any other point, that's the main point. That's why when you finish this, and you can go to these sites. These sites are, uh, let's see, how do you do control and right click. Oh, that's right, because it's a PDF, because these are embedded in, I don't have the ability of clicking on them that way. But you copy and paste that into a link and you will get all of the case laws for that. But instead of you attaching all the case law, we put the link there so they can go directly to the website. Because there's a ton of their own case laws throughout this document. So there's no need to add more, as I said. Now, these I think are clickable. These you can click on. The other ones, because they're not blue, you can't click on. But these, if I clicked on it, it should. Or will it? Nope, it's locked. Can't click on them. But they are links. They were links in the original document, but because the document is locked so that people can't amend and alter and kill the document by adding in a bunch of junk, uh, we had to put a password on it. All right. And after all of that, this is your verification and validation of complaint. The law does not require that a verification be sworn under penalty of perjury. It just requires that it be a sworn or declared statement. And so that's what this is, and that's all you're doing. And you're going to put your autograph, not your signature. What is your autograph? You are the only person who can determine what your autograph is. Then you take it, get it notarized. After you get, and the notaries, they may or may not like this notary and tell them they're, you don't have to argue with them. You can attach their notary page because they will have a notary page. You can attach their notary page. We have notaries at SACCOM and I have not worked out with them a way of getting this done for everybody. So I can't promise that just yet. Okay. That's this document. That's the first document you're going to fill out. It, you should have received the email already. The second document you're going to fill out, and we're going to open that up now. You've already done this one, so you don't have to fill this out. I'm just going to explain to you what the document is. Now, yours was done before this one was complete, when we added the QWR information. Uh, Mr. Kahapi, did you do a QWR? No, I did not. Shame on you. Okay, are you still in the same house that started all of this? Yes, of course, yeah. Okay, so what I want you to do is you're going to do a QWR now. So you're going to send this document off. The reason why you have to do a QWR, because the QWR, according to the RISPA, the real estate, uh, oh God, Settlement Procedures Act, which is RISPA, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. It's the one that authorizes QWRs. It's the one that says you have a right to do a QWR, a qualified written request. Graham Leach Bailey Act, it's because of that act that, what's the name of that stupid, uh, the, see, that's my mind right now. So many things on my mind. And today is a much easier day. I've been outside working and everything. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, the CFPB, that's how they got started. It's because of the act that allows for the QWR. Read the red and edit the red. There should be no red left in this document. 
once you edit it, there should be no red. All the sections that are red are what you're supposed to edit. Now that we got that cleared up, because I, I say that to people and I promise you, and I know you are not that type that you're gonna not get it, but I promise you there are quite a few people out there that just, they can't get even a thought. Even if you gave them the thought, they still wouldn't be able to get it. And those are some of the people I'm dealing with on a daily basis. And they, because it's not because they're stupid or retarded or ignorant or dumb. They are so used to having people tell them no and tell them, no, you can't do this or you can't do that, that they second guess themselves at every angle, every step of the way, which is, in my opinion, stupid but it is the way of our world. This document has the, now the new one, the one that we're looking at right now, it has the 9-203, attachment and enforcement of security interests, proceeds, supported obligation. This shows that your property, you had no right in the collateral. So your loan is not a secured loan as identified in law. And the very fact that Penny Mac decided to file a lawsuit against you for that security, decided to tell you you owe the debt, and they decided to go according to the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act is a violation of your rights. They had no authority to be sending you anything referencing the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act. Your property did not qualify under that. Not in this document, but in the other paperwork that we're going to talk about in a moment. There is this thing about debt collectors. Most people think when they contact the debt collector that the debt collector can just give them some stupid response. The debt collector cannot give you some stupid response. If you are dealing with a debt collector, the debt collector must, if you sit up there and challenge the debt, they must verify the debt. Verification is not just sending you some stupid statement saying, hey, it's verified. That's what the courts have been saying only to find out that's a lie. So the other document breaks down the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, its exact wording, since the courts say that verification is nowhere in the act explained by Congress, then they have to go by the ordinary meaning of verification. So I use their legal terminology and the rules of the court for following a verified complaint and what the verified complaint requires. And then I use the actual definition from Black's Law Dictionary. Both of them says a sworn or declared statement. So that has to come from the original creditor. They've been getting away with this ever since they came up with that act because the courts have been operating on presumption. They've been telling people, well, you can't do this and you can't do that. And no, that's not what it means. They've been saying things like that. Nobody's been rebutting their presumption. They've been allowing them just to say that and walk away. All right. Collateral is deposit accounts, electronic chattel paper, investment property, and a letter of credit rights. And the secure party has control under blah, blah, blah. This is taken directly from the act. This shows that your property does not qualify as collateral. So that makes that loan unsecured, okay? We put this here specifically and purposely so that when you go to court, you don't need to add anything. You bring this document and it's all there. Now you're doing something else in this document. I believe Hawaii is a uh, equitable redemption state. And you'll have to check on the equitable redemption uh, it's a simple phrase, equitable redemption. What you're doing here is you're going to assign, wait, Mr. Kayapi, whose name is on your uh, mortgage? Both of yours or just yours? Uh, I, I, I think I might That's have to a shame. Double that is a shame. Lord have mercy, that is a shame. This man yeah. doesn't even know if his wife is on his mortgage document. Okay, this is the way it is. If that doc, if that property is listed in your name only, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna assign your equitable interest, not your equity in the property. This has nothing to do with your equity. 
This has everything to do with your equitable interest, your ownership rights. That's your equitable interest. You're going to assign that to your wife or somebody else whom you trust who won't stab you in the back. Okay? You're going to assign that interest to them. And you're going to, they are going to give you $10. That's all they need to do is give you a $10 bill. Doesn't I don't care if you give them back the $10. You can loan them $10 right after that. I don't care. And you can tell them uh, you can pay me whenever. Okay, but you have to give them $10. You have to document the $10, create a receipt showing that you gave them $10 for your equitable rights of redemption in the property. You do that. Now that person will send and you and that person can sign this document together. That way you're both sending the contract to the bank. You will send this document to them. It's called equitable redemption. That's what this section right here is about. That's all this is talking about is the equitable redemption rights. You get to here. I hereby notify, uh, you are hereby notified that I hereby pledge tender a payment for the reference above blah, blah, debt and so on and so forth. It's an obligation of the United States and you are hereby assigning equitable interest. This talks about the suspension provisions of the so-called banking holiday. When Trump announced the national holiday last year, he was continuing the banking holiday. That's why he, these are his words, I am officially declaring a national emergency. Well, when he did so, he was doing so under the Trading with the Enemy Act, Section B, not Section 1. And when he did that, he was continuing the banking holiday, announcing that he was continuing the banking holiday. And like everybody else, I thought Trump was going to do something. I thought he was going to go in there and change things, because if you guys don't understand, he watched some of my videos. And he was hanging on Alex Jones's coattail for the longest of time, except when Alex got in a little bit of trouble, then Trump abandoned him. But he was listening, so he knew these things, and he didn't do anything to correct any of it. So here's the section that talks about the $10, good and valuable consideration. There has to be an exchange of something of value. They say $10 is the least valuable thing you can give. So that's why I say you have the person hand you $10. You're going to exchange your equitable interest. That's what this is all about. No one can stop you for assigning your equitable interest. Now, what equitable redemption is all about, this is the way it works. It says you have the way, uh, the right to redeem your property from a creditor. All you have to do is pay it off. I know you're saying, where am I going to get that money from? You don't have to because you give the creditor 10 days to respond and the creditor doesn't respond in 10 days, they automatically lose. That <laughs> sounds like the arbitration process. It's exactly the same process. It's an administrative process. Arbitration is an administrative process. It is not a civil process. The courts keep trying to make it civil. It's a summary process. It is not a court civil litigation. Just like foreclosure is not a civil litigation. We'll get to that part in a moment because I'm going to show you the uh, case law that's directly associated with foreclosure not being a, what you call it, uh, civil litigation. All right. One last thing in this document is this right here. This is the equitable redemption coupon. Okay. The only thing you're doing in here is you're putting in the name of whomever the person is who's claiming they're owed some money. Your address, your information, you're changing this number up here to whatever it is. You can create a new number, just add, remove a number and add another number and that's your number. You're gonna put twice the value of the home, at least I would put twice the value and no more, twice the value of the home. Now remember, you're not giving them money, you're giving them credit, okay? And then you're going to put the loan number here. And then you're going to put this. When you sign this, this is not your autograph. This is your authorization. This is the 
This section right up here, this is the endorsement. Pay to the order of. So you're paying and pledging to the order of whomever it is without recourse. That's the endorsement. You're only authorizing it. An endorsement is not a signature, though so many people believe it is. Qualified written requests. This is that section. It has all the information required by the law. And it even brings up the information that was brought in that lawsuit. When I was bringing the defrauded homeowners of America lawsuit, and I told everybody I was getting ready to bring the defrauded, home, the defrauded homeowners of America lawsuit before the courts, and I was going to do it as a class action. Well, they ignored my complaint, dismissing it, ignoring the appeal, and the attorney generals went and brought the same claim. Everything that I was saying, the attorney generals went and brought the same claim. They're the ones who, they even brought up the single family home loan guarantee program. Everything that I was bringing up, they brought up. And then they brought up all the deceptives and unfair practices and all that. They added that junk. Okay, they did it because I was representing a class. And that class would have grown. And if a group of attorneys had taken over and come and handled the case, it would have been a lot of money. And so to keep that from happening, they went ahead and processed their case, took me and took me out of the picture by putting me inside a nice little box for a couple of years. This happened in 2012. At the end of 2012, when they filed their lawsuit and they settled their lawsuit 2014, just before I got out. So that very same information you're adding here because they've already pled guilty. With that being said, the next section is the caveat and the arbitration clause. And that's it. The same thing as the contract was before. Oh, and this right here, we put in the issues of a contract. Okay, we put in a valid arbitration. This is the doctrine taken from the 11th Circuit. To qualify as a valid arbitration, under the FAA, the arbitration must consider the evidence and arguments from each party advanced by those parties. That's it. Don't need anything else. If you're asking why are they ignoring it, because they cannot let SITCOM Arbitration Association do what it's been doing. It undermines the entire system that they have going because they want to control the doctrine. They want to control the setting. They want to control the parties. And so organizations like SITCOM causes a lot of problems. All right. And let's see, what is this? I think this is the, oh, the terms and definitions of what's in the contract. And here at the bottom, you got to make sure that, that uh, there are three places where the contract number is. It's at the beginning, in the middle, on the, no, there are four. It's at the beginning. It's in the middle on the coupon. It's in the section for the arbitration. And it's here, last paragraph. So there are four times the contract number has to be changed. So if you did a replace all, copied the contract number, replaced it, and then did the replace all thing, if in Microsoft Word, you only have to do it once. All right, this section is for your benefit. It's in red. So the red, you just have to read and that's it. This document is self-explanatory and you don't have to fill out much. You just have to fill out certain sections and that's it. That's why everything that you need to take care of is in red. All right, we get rid of that. And now we go to the, oh, so that's why. I was wondering why it was doing a read only thing. It's because this one is open. All right, we're gonna go to the next one and that's gonna be, let's do, we're gonna do the memorandum of um, case sites. Now, this is what I was planning this meeting for uh, to begin with, primarily for you and Mr. Johnson and for the other arbitrators, for them to know and see that what was being done, nobody violated a single law. Uh, where is my court? Oh, because my um, hourglass thing is spinning, 
I have to wait for it to give me control so that I can click on it. Now, here's a question I have for the two of you. You haven't had a problem hearing me, have you? No, no, not at all. Please, okay. Yeah. I am actually glad that I deleted those that adapter because it's they got into my system and they've been changing and altering certain things in the registry. And the way I can tell they've been altering certain things in the registry, because when I shut down my computer, I make sure that certain things are done. I make sure that I don't just abruptly shut it down, but I make sure that I go through and shut everything down. Then I come back and I find files have been moved around. I find the last file that I was working on is not the last file that I was working on. This is what we're doing. All four of these documents go together. Okay. Now, when I say all four of them go together, they don't all go to the same parties. They all go together. They complete an entire packet. When you go to court and you're dealing with the courts and you're dealing with foreclosure, that's a summary proceeding. It's only based on the evidence. And so we're creating the evidence. So this is a memorandum of court concurring opinion. We're not doing a memorandum of law. Court opinion is not law. We're doing a memorandum of the court opinions. A party borrower must have an interest in the collateral prior to pledging the collateral as security for the loan. It doesn't matter which one we choose because all of these are talking about that, including the last one. A debtor that has sold an account Chattel paper, payment entanglement, uh, entanglement, or promissory note does not retain any legal or equitable interest in a collateral sold. Deemed rights of the debtor if buyer security interest is unperfected. Okay, when you went and purchased a home, you didn't own the collateral. Only the uh, the seller did but the seller's not purchasing the home. The seller's the only one who could have authorized anybody to use his property as collateral or as a co-signer for a loan. That's all these laws are saying, or these so-called cases are saying. See, the seller retains no interest. The seller retains no interest after he sells the property. So this one, injuries caused under RISPA. RISPA requires you to document that you suffered an injury, that you sustained an injury. Without documenting that you sustained an injury, you ain't got nothing coming. So it says in this context, I believe damage is synonymous with injury. So no question of damages arises out of a cognizable injury. Ladies and gentlemen, basically what it's saying is you don't really need to document that you've been injured. You just need to document an injury. You don't have to document a physical injury, but you must document that there's been some type of injury. The availability of statutory damages does not depend on the plaintiff having suffered actual damages or other prejudice as a result of the violation. So you don't, you just have to document that you suffered injury. So your credit profile, your, um, public persona because they did this in the public and your, what is the other thing? Your credit worthiness, just have to bring up things like that to solidify that it's already been taken care of. I'll talk about it in a minute. Give me one second. Got about 15 more minutes to explain this to you guys. And Mr. Kurt, I know you have people who have mortgages, so this will benefit them as well going to the next section because these are this is 23 pages worth of case text the borrower's rights to the collateral signifying a before okay. acquired and your phone the phone is breaking up i can hear you but it's like breaking up it just started okay yeah yeah and i was that's why i asked oh, earlier phone. yeah that's oh, that's why phone. that's why i asked earlier because i was expecting it and because I am sharing the screen, I am tethering, but it's Sunday. And the unique thing about where I live, there's not a lot of people using Wi-Fi. There's not a lot of people on their cell phones out here because there's not a lot of people out here. And I'd say probably seven miles each direction. I have about maybe seven neighbors. 
in each direction, seven wow. miles going in each direction, adding it all up. I have about seven neighbors. And I know they're not on the internet, you know, because most of them are sitting up there watching somebody's TV on their satellite dish or something. But oh well. All right. The borrower, this talks about acquired property, but it says before acquired and after acquired collateral. Before acquired collateral, meaning that you had the collateral before you acquired the loan. Okay, that makes the loan a secured loan. If it's an after acquired collateral, that means that you had the collateral after you acquired the loan. If you had rights to the collateral after you acquired the loan, then you have no right to list it as collateral while signing the loan and making it a mortgage loan. It can only be a personal loan. It cannot be a mortgage, cannot be a mortgage loan. It cannot be a residential mortgage. It cannot be any of that junk. It cannot be a secured loan. So here is one of the cases. A security agreement may create or provide for a security interest in after acquired collateral, but that interest will not attach until the debtor acquires the collateral. So it's not a secured loan because it wasn't secured until after you acquired rights to the collateral, which means the loan, when it originated, wasn't a secure loan. And they always talk about the originating loan. And that's what you want to talk about. Now, we're going to go to the next section, and then we're going to go to the final doc, because we're covering all four docs here. And I think I just added this section because I am doing a video to explain this to other people. Foreclosure is a summary proceeding and the moving party, uh, oh, excuse me, and I just put and the moving party. I'll, I'll finish that out because I just started working on this earlier. Foreclosure is a summary proceeding. That's why you don't get to bring any evidence. That's why you don't get to have witnesses and a jury trial or any of that. It's just a summary proceeding. So it's a summary judgment proceeding. And all the bank has to do is prove that there's a delinquent debt and that there's an outstanding debt and they win. That's why people are losing in foreclosure. That's why the banks have been getting away with this. However, it's not just a summary proceeding for them. See, this just talks about foreclosure actions as ordinarily summary and in rem proceedings, meaning you ain't got to do nothing else. The court is making all the decisions based upon the evidence, just like the arbitration process. Okay, all of these cases talks about foreclosure being a summary proceeding. That's what they're all about, each one of them. Now that we have that, now we go to the next one. Give me one second. This is the last one, last thing we're going to mention today. And motion for a summary judgment template. It will be this one. So that you get it, equal protection of law says that if the other side gets to use the administrative procedure, then so can you. So you're not challenging the debt here. You're not saying, I don't owe them no money. You're saying, yeah, there, there was a contract, but the application, what they're trying to do, they can't do. They cannot bring me to the non-judicial foreclosure proceeding. No, they have to go through the civil proceedings. And that's what you're doing. And you're asking the court for summary judgment. Now, do either of you know how much it costs to file a summary judgment in the courts? $47. $47 is all you are doing to get all this taken care of. Each of you, your family, your friends, this should take about three months to complete. And you're in court in three months. Now, here's the unique thing. Let's say the judge says, uh-uh, y'all ain't getting nothing. Get them out of my courtroom. That's fine. They dismiss this. You simply take this document right here. You download a copy of their template for a notice of uh, appeal. And then you take this document and you simply write, after you get rid of all this, right on this uh, right side, you write appeal brief. And you can add whatever beginning comment you want, but this will serve as your appeal brief. The only thing you want to include is the proposed order. Now, Again, this basically tells the court, you're not a lawyer. You're not a learned person. 
you don't know their procedures, but you're going to do the best you can to articulate the issues presented with specificity. And you're going to avoid giving conclusions because you're going to quote the courts and Congress. And you're going to avoid making statements of fact unless it's supported by the actual words of Congress and the court. So if they want to deny you and say that it's gobbledygook, then they'll be saying their own junk is gobbledygook. You see, we're using their words, and you'll find that in this document, very few words of the petitioner are here. Most of the words are copied and pasted from the courts. Okay. Now, let's go. No, we're not going to cover this whole document because it's, it's too much in it. This is a total of 45 pages. Now, the reason why it's 45 pages is because this is your summary judgment request. This is where you put the information about the Truth and Lending Act. This is where you put the information about, hey, the Fair Debt Collections Practice Act and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Okay, that's where you, that's what all this, and we even put the RISPA information showing how RISPA works and how you have to document an actual injury. So we make it a point to highlight the injuries normally sustain. So you don't have to add anything to it because it has, it covers everything. This document is only here to document one thing and I want you to pay attention to this. We're gonna go down to the judicial order, proposed order, because with every matter like this, there must be a proposed order. That was number two. So I think we're already in, there it is right there. And this has the same type of acknowledgement and notary stamp. The reason why you're getting this notarized because it's a petition for summary judgment. It's an affidavit. Because it's an affidavit, they will have to rebut the affidavit. If they fail to rebut the affidavit that's placed in the record based on firsthand knowledge in this proceeding, it because it's a verified complaint, once it has the notary seal, it's a verified complaint. The court cannot ignore that. It becomes evidence, and that becomes something a person can bring about on appeal if they were to be stupid. Now, we this is the proposed summary and declaratory judgment judicial intervention order. Okay, we that's why there's no case caption because the court doesn't put a case caption on their junk. Then we talk about what's the proper procedure for a non-judicial foreclosure or the trust deed act foreclosures. And one second. Like I said, this is page 23 of 45. That's how much information is here. Equal protection principle says that if they have the right to go in for a declaratory judgment, you have the right to go in for a declaratory judgment. It cannot be one-sided. The law has to be equal and fair to everyone. So because foreclosure is a summary position um, motion, here's your argument. Well, Your Honor, because of these proceedings, I don't have the right to file a counter lawsuit to their allegations. Since they have started the foreclosure process, I have the right to counter that by asking for a summary judgment. Because the proceedings have already started, they're just administrative. So I have the right to do a summary judgment on the administrative portion of the proceedings. They're not going to like that, but they're not going to be able to argue that. What's going to happen is because of my video, people around the entire country are going to start doing summary judgment requests and foreclosure. Just like with arbitration, they're going to have to change something. They cannot allow it to stand. It has to change. So you may not benefit immediately, but you will benefit because every decision, I'm going to have people send me a copy of the final order from the court, and we're going to go through to the Supreme Court of the United States. And we're going to do a motion for certiorari. And I'll do a, a combination motion of certiorari and motion for writ of mandamus, ordering the courts to do what they're supposed to do. Um, yeah, uh, Ronnie, go ahead. I just looked at the screen. I don't often look at, look at the screen, so you guys just have to speak up. But go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a foreclosure on me yet. Doesn't matter. But does you're challenging, no, you're challenging the fact that when you, the, the loan origination, 
you're challenging the loan origination that they said that you didn't need any collateral. And then at closing, they wouldn't give you the keys unless you signed over the collateral. That's what you're challenging. You follow me? That, that's why I said we're not, uh, yeah, we're not yeah. yeah, we're not challenging the debt. We're not challenging a debt. We're not challenging the foreclosure. But because they say that this is a mortgage-backed security, then your only option is the summary option. You don't have the right to take somebody to court. There is no state of your paying anything while the proceedings go on because these are summary proceedings. Foreclosure is summary proceedings. So yes, I know you're not, when you say you're not involved in foreclosure, I understood that when you said you were still in the home. So, but yes, this is not for foreclosure. This is for, hey, you people lied to me. You misrepresented the information. I'm sorry, let me go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll make it clearer this way. Uh, we're gonna go all the way back up to the top because we started from the bottom. And claim of alleged criminal conduct, mortgage, mortgage fraud, conspiracy misrepresentation to achieve unjust enrichment and a formal dispute of debt claim challenge. That's why you're attaching all of this to your summary judgment proceeding. See, you're just going for summary judgment. You're just going, hey, they violated my rights. Oh, and by the way, let me show you the next part. Sorry. Uh, the oh, and by the way, was not, let me show you the next part. The oh, and by the way, is what I was going to say next. But I figured, why say that next when I can show it to you? That's summary judgment, letting you know you have the right to do a summary judgment and what summary judgment is for and so on and so forth. This section right after it is the part about, this is where the court comes to the conclusion and it talks about the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. The Fair Debt Collections Practices Act is that they are performing a debt collection on people's property every time they send you a notice of a bill. So what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, we asked them for a validation of debt and a verification of debt. They have to provide us a sworn statement and they're not doing it. Well, some courts have said, they ain't gotta provide y'all that. Well, this is what we wrote and then I will get on with the get known. Fair Debt Collection Practice Act does not supply a definition for verification. It is a settled rule of construction that where a term employed by a statute is not defined in the statute, the term must be given its ordinary, plain, general, accepted meaning. So verification, does anybody know what verification means? It's okay, this is the court talking. Our sister courts have held that verification when filing an action for foreclosure on a mortgage for a residential real property, the claim for relief shall be verified by the claimant seeking to foreclose the mortgage. When the verification of a document is required, the document filed shall include an oath affirmation or the following statement. I declare in the penalty of perjury that the following and the foregoing is true and correct, blah, blah, blah. So then the court said, well, verification doesn't mean verification. It means this and it means that. In the Non-Judicial Foreclosure Act and in the Fair Debt Collections Practice Act, when it talks about a statement, it uses the word statement several times. When it uses the word verification, it is sometimes in the same paragraph of statement, but it's definitely its own definition for statement and for verification. So what we did is we took the sections three, four, and five, where they say statement, 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 that, and then we took the other section, the final section that says the debt collector obtains verification of the debt. So there's the cease any and all, blah, blah, blah. And that's why I said they use the term statement and verification. So that means they don't mean the same thing. They are to obtain verification of a debt or a copy of a judgment. Well, we know a judgment has a certification on it. And so with this verification, a copy of such verification or judgment, we know that they are meaning a written document, not just some stupid statement. So I break down that for the proposed order for the judge. Again, I expect they will ignore. I don't care about them ignoring it. We have to get this stuff on the record. That's why I use their words. 
I need them to look stupid. I even put the two legal dictionary definitions in here, Black's Law definition and Valentin's legal dictionary. And the final part is just the dipping up of the funds. The reason why we're doing this is because the Federal Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, RISPA, allows for you to collect $1,000 per violation. Well, this proposed order says that they've been violating people's rights for at least the past 30 months, two and a half years. So because they've been violating people's rights for at least two and a half years, and it gives the other party, either party, the opportunity of rebutting this, but that equates to $1,000 a month for 30 months, $30,000. Uh, $30, now, that's for the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act. Now you got RISPA, and then you got the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Well, that's $1,000 a month for each if they violated those rights in each of those and failed to correct it. So it eventually equates to when you add in the other factors, $60,000, and then we got the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And when you add in that they've been reporting it on a person's credit since 45 days after the first payment was missed, they usually report it after the 45-day mark as delinquent. Well, when they did that, you're saying that that was a false reporting to the credit reporting agencies. Well, after the 45 days, that gives you 28 months when you break it all down. Because 45 days, every single, uh, 45 days for one month, which is almost two months. So it gives you 28 months times 30, which is 120,000 but now you got to remove the two months. Well, 130,000, no, sorry, I got to do the math. There are four credit reporting bureaus and you multiply that by 30, that gives you 120,000. But because it's only 45 days from the first, so you got to get rid of that month and a half. So it brings you to 28 and a half months. We'd say 28 months times 1,000. And that gives us, $112,000. So that's what this one does is break the math down and brings us to 112. And again, it lets everybody know that you are, and then at the end of all that, it is 172,000. We had 15,000 in attorney's fees, bringing us to 187,000. And it's everybody's case. Every single person is following this. They don't have to add the numbers. They don't have to subtract the numbers. They don't have to add to it, subtract from it. They just leave it alone and they follow it in the court. So Mr. Kahapi, I would say like the Isley brothers, you got work to do. And Mr. Gibbs, you have family members who have mortgages. I would do it for at least one of them and see the outcome. If it works, then I'd do it for everybody and their grandmama. This hasn't been done before. I am one yeah, of them. I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Gibbs, no, to say first? Wait, wait, hold on. One person at a time. Mr. Cappy first, then you, Mr. Gibbs. Go ahead. Okay, so for the, the uh, $10, <clears throat> um, is it okay if I uh, put the $10 from, can my truck make the purchase? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, you can have the trust make the purchase. You can uh, your trust can acquire the equitable rights to your property. It just needs to be another person. There has to be value exchange between the parties. Never had that question asked before, but the law does not specify that a person receiving equitable redemption rights needs to be a physical person because companies receive it all the time. There are several cases. So, you know, it can be a corporation. Okay, Mr. Gibbs, what was your question? No, I was just saying that, um, yeah, I do know some family members. Um, I, I would like to know what I could do for myself, but that's, you know. Um, uh, I'm I sorry, I, my... I, I don't know. If you if you got a mortgage, yes, but you, you, I, you just got to understand because you were an arbitrator, I don't do the selfish mm -hmm. things. I don't do the, the questions for individuals. I'm only explaining yeah. this and 
you guys were supposed to benefit from the information. Okay. So you received all of the documents. I'm going to send you guys a copy of this video. I would strongly suggest you watch it because that's why I went over the documents so that you guys could have that. Now, look, I need you all's permission because this is a private meeting. It's a private legal meeting. I'd like to put this online so that everybody can hear me explain what's going on and why we're doing what we're doing. Permission granted. What about you, Mr. Gibbs? Yes, that's fine. Okay, now the reason why I'm only using the last names and so forth, not using anybody's was uh, now my system shows people's names and everything, but I'm um, I'm only using last names and everything and no numbers are showing up. But what's happening is this information will be available and people will get to see and hear exactly how we're processing this. You see, people have been trying to accuse me and the people I talk to of conspiracies. Well, I want everybody to know that I'm not hiding anything. And since I didn't plan on putting this up, like I said, I was doing a video. I'm just going to attach that video to this video so that the people can see exactly what's going on. It's going to be an hour and 30 minute video, but they'll see exactly what's going on. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. And then we can go ahead and end the conversation.